you know, I worry about this one, I worry about this, I worry about the future. You have to make decisions based on HIV. I remember one, one, one friend of mine said, hey, Saudi, I'm now wondering, should I go for my PhD or should I just work? So I'm like, get, it, get your HIV test first so that if, you, if you've got it, then you just continue to work so that you make money for your children. You understand? It's a, it's a very practical decision. And if you don't, then you can go because you know you've got, you've got a, more, a lot more years. It's a normal, normal conversation. It is not about, oh, yeah, I had so and so. No, it is our reality. People are caught in this war, in this crossfire called AIDS. And people are dying in this crossfire called AIDS. The structure of the African family has changed. Many, many years ago, I grew up in a, in a small family, three, three girls. Um, but then I had a huge extended family. So Christmas, New Year, Easter, it was always full at my mother's house. It's noisy. And everyone has voice, a voice like mine. So you can imagine. It was a noisy family. You know? It was wonderful, happy. I had a very happy childhood. But as time went, something started to change. We, people started getting sick. People started to dwindle. Dwindle. Today, I'll be lucky if five make it to a Christmas function. Me. I'm not talking about other people, I'm talking about me. And if I have faced that reality, what about others? And I come from a very educated family. What about those people who don't have the privilege of educating? Because this thrives on poverty. It is real. And citizenship, global citizenship, is important. I would like to dedicate this lecture to two very, very important people in my life. I lost my mother. She was 52. She had a PhD, very educated. I lost my sister. She was 36. She had a degree. They are all gone. In my family, it's just my sister, myself, my daughter, and her daughter. Yet, there used to be so many. This is real. I'd like to join me to sing this song in the memory of these two people. Um, it's this little thing here. You just read from this. In the program. Seems like yesterday we used to rock the show. I laced the track, you locked the flow. So far from hanging on the block of dope. Notorious, they got to know that. Life ain't always what it's going to be. Words can't express what you mean to me. Even though you're gone, we still a team. Do your family, I'll fulfill your dreams. In the future, can't wait to see if you open up the gates for me. Reminisce some time, the night they took my friend. Try to black it out, but it plays again. When it's real, feelings hard to conceal. Can't imagine all the pain I feel. Give anything to hear half the breath. I know you're still living your life after death.
my heart is where I keep it, friend. Memories give me the strength I need to proceed. Strength I need to believe. My thoughts big, I just can't define. Wish I could turn back the hands of time. Us in the six, shop for new clothes and kicks. You and me taking flicks, making hits. Stages they receive you on. Still can't believe you're gone. Give anything to hear half your breath. I know you're still living your life after death. Thank you very, very much, COD, for your very inspiring words and your inspiring practice. And we're really, really honored to have you here with us. Thank you so much for coming and for speaking with us. Um, we have a reception following, and we usually take some short time, all too short time, for, for comments and questions and discussion. Um, let me say that... Um, Unlike what Marilyn said, there's no map in your, in, your, in your program on how to get to this reception. And unlike what Sarah said, it is not directly across the road. <laughs> you could suspect us of actually um, trying to uh, prevent you getting there, but we would, we would like to continue this conversation and the connections. Uh, Massey College is, as you go out of this building onto the uh, Devonshire Place, turn left and walk down, it's on the other side of the road just before you get to Hoskin. It's in Massey College. Follow somebody in front of you. Uh, and I, I also should say that um, usually we have someone leave here now to go and tell them to get things ready for people because, um, so if one of the many, many volunteers who've, uh, not all of whom have been named, could go off to Massey and uh, tell them to get things uh, warmed up, that would be appreciated too. Okay, so um, please let's take, would you like to stand back up so everyone can see you? Uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering. Because I've got a mic so I can. Place yourself wherever you like. No, I'm fine. I'll, okay, I'll just, yeah. um, who, who can, just indicate if you'd like to fill. Just and if you to. come to this, the microphone, then it will be very good for, because we, are, we, we have videotaped uh, this lecture and we're recording it, so it would be good if you could go to the mic if you'd like to uh, make a comment. Phil. Hi, COD. I'm Phil from the Centre. Um, I wondered if you could describe the, the law, the prevention um, against uh, domestic violence uh, a little bit, and also how you see that um, could be implemented if you had the resources. Yeah, about three. Yeah. yeah, okay. Siodi would like me to take about three uh, questions or comments. So I have one here and then one there. Um, thanks for tonight and my condolences. Um, I was wondering, you said the, um, 
a lot about the empowerment of women and the feminization of the epidemic. Um, what role for men do you think in changing the attitudes of men and how do you approach that? How do we as women approach that issue? Yeah, um, please, I'd like to know how some of us can help these women in the country because you've mentioned that you're doing a whole lot of things. I'm wondering what we can also do, the little that we can do. To. Yes, so I'll, I'll take those. Um, the the prevention on the uh, on, on domestic violence works as follows. Uh, it basically provides protection orders uh, for women who are uh, abused, like for example, emotionally abused, financially abused, um, economically abused, um, psychologically abused. So, for example, if a woman uh, is being refused, which is very common, is being refused uh, by her partner to work. If she gets a job or she gets a, an idea for a small business and the husband says, as far as I'm concerned, my wife cannot go and work. If you go, it means you want to go sleep with other men. Uh, she can then go to a magistrate and ask the magistrate to give her a protection order so that to, to order the husband to no longer do that to continue, for her to continue to work, for example. The other one would be if they say if it's marital rape or attempts for marital rape. Uh, the same, the same um, action can be taken by a magistrate to say, you know, he, he's engaging in marital rape. I uh, would like you to apply an order to, 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 um, to stop him from, uh, from, from doing that. It is only when there's a breach of the order that is when a person is now taken, to, uh, is now, uh, taken uh, from a criminal perspective. Because one of the uh, critical issues that arose was that the penal code as it stands today uh, says that any person who assaults another person shall be liable of an offence and shall be, you know, shall be whatever, sentenced or jailed for a number of years. But what was happening is that women would get beaten black and blue and they would, they would not want to seek either police help or even if they go and report to the police and the police go and arrest their husband, they would go back and say, I didn't mean you should arrest him. What do you think I'm going to eat? I just wanted you to talk to him. You know, so, um, but the police were like, but we are not mandated to talk to these men. We are mandated to arrest them. Apart from that, you find that the village would, would gang up against a woman who, who gets her husband arrested. Or the family would gang up against her and say, okay, so now you've done this, we'll also do something to you. So, what, so as a response to that, in, in our consultations, it was found it's better to have a protection order whereby the government, because we wanted to make the government account you know, for women. So the government should step in and enter the bedroom or whatever and say, stop doing this or you get arrested. And it's, it is really supposed to be effective because people don't even want the government, in whatever its form, to know that they are really conducting these acts of domestic violence. So that's, that's basically how it, work, it would work. So the idea is it needs magistrates to be trained on the law, to understand it and apply those orders because they are the critical players. But as, as well as the police, because we've also said the reference point is for women to go to police whereby they should be advised or even help to, be, uh, to fill in the, 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 um, the forms. But most police officers, the majority, they have no clue what we're talking about. So it's difficult to implement because when a woman goes now, they'll still go and arrest the husband or they'll just say, come on, that's a family affair, why bring it here? So that's, that's the challenge, and that's how we, we, we anticipated that we you know, would, would work on this. Um, the, the role of men, I think the, the, for me the role of men is, 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 is in so many, uh, it, it's, it, it, can be, it can be in so many ways. Men as decision makers, it's important to, to make them understand about the vulnerability of women, because the critical decision makers in the country, those who pass laws, who make money, who, who are chiefs, who are police, a lot of them are men in my country. So what we have said that men as decision makers need to be effectively engaged. Through various programs, I cannot think of a program now, but the understanding that you cannot exclude men in all this, we need to work with them. But then men as communities, community members, we have said that chiefs need to change their mindset. In, in, in turn, they need to change the mindset of their men, you know, to, to work with women, to, to make sure that their actions are not detrimental to the health of the women. Now, the, the third point is about what can we do? It's a very good question. 
There are a number of issues you can do. You can, you can make this particular government, your government, accountable, much more accountable to the way it is responding to HIV AIDS in Africa. What are the programs is it supporting and how much money is it supporting and to what extent is that money enough? For me, that's, that's a critical aspect. So you can start with your MPs, if you have an MP, or you know, councillors, or you, you, that is your local government leaders, agitating. You know, you, what I always say that what we need for the, in response to the HIV pandemic is a social movement. Not little people responding in little spaces and forming organizations. It's about a social movement. The way people responded to apartheid, you know, I always say it's, it's, we need to do something like the way we did with apartheid. That's the best response. You know, not a silent response because you don't see it. You know, so for me, that's, to what extent can you make this a social movement in your own spaces, private and political spaces? Yes. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Do, I think maybe we'll take three more, if there are three more, and then we'll, we'll check time. So, yes, would you like to... Take statistics on the same pandemic in Eastern Europe, in, um, <clears throat> in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Poland, where I come from as well. If you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a comment. I'm glad I'm here today because um, coming from the Caribbean, the Caribbean now is falling second to the um, spread of HIV and AIDS. And I, um, I want to ask you whether you have some sort of um, knowledge you can share to Caribbean people after experiencing what your country has experienced so that although we are second in the Caribbean to the spread, uh, for the spread of HIV AIDS, what we can do maybe to prevent it from um, spreading. And another um, statement I just want to say that um, I, I think we should also think of um, as you said, what we can do and what we can do here and what we can do when we travel abroad also too because the, uh, um, the, the, the epidemic, I would say, in the Caribbean is very much spread by the, the, the tourist industry and we must reflect and think about it when we go into the Caribbean as tourists. 